Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes and today I'm here with Dr. Peter Decioli. He is Assistant Professor in the Department of Political Science at Stony Brook University. His research investigates how the human mind uses principles of strategy to solve problems in the social world. Much of his work has focused on moral condemnation, especially the functions of morally judging other people, moralistic punishment, and moral impartiality. In another line of work, he studies how people form alliances, how they choose their loyalties to others, and how they display and conceal their loyalties. A third project looks at our sense of ownership by using a virtual environment to observe, to observe resource disputes in the laboratory. In recent years, he has been designing online games for experiments about politics, including redistribution of wealth, social safety nets, alliance formation, and political negotiation. And these are mostly the topics that we're going to, cov to cover today in our interview. So, Dr. Descioli, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. Sure. Thank you, Ricardo, for having me. Uh, very, very happy to be here. Okay, great. So, uh, let me just ask you a first question before we get into more specific topics. So, today we're going to talk a lot about morality, right? And more specifically, the evolution of morality. So, uh, could you tell us perhaps first uh, what morality is about. Um, and I guess that when people think about morality, they usually tend to associate it with good or positive behavior um, or altruistic behavior even, but that's not, uh, uh, that's not really what we're talking about here, right? Yeah, so that's, that's absolutely right. Um, so I'm going to try to draw a distinction between uh, altruism, uh, being nice to others, and uh, moral judgment. So we morally judge behaviors, especially others' behaviors, uh, sometimes our own uh, as well. Uh, so I put together uh, some slides to uh, sort of uh, to give you a broad overview of um, uh, theories of the evolution of morality. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so if you don't mind, I, I could uh, go through a, a couple of slides. Um, and uh, they, uh, so I start off with some basics of evolutionary psychology. And um, I know that you know that and that uh, a lot of your audience already knows uh, basics of evolutionary psychology. Uh, but, th but it's just a few slides about this. And I think it's really important to get on the same page about a, a few things. Uh, and so, uh, and also to be reminded of them as we take on a topic so difficult as morality, which is probably the most difficult topic. Uh, in the social sciences, philosophers have been, you know, pounding their heads uh, about it for centuries. Uh, so, so, uh, so I want to do a, a couple slides uh, to talk about uh, evolutionary psychology and the perspective uh, that it brings uh, from my perspective. And so, it's just a couple slides, uh, pretty simple, and emphasizes the parts I think are are important. Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead, please. Yeah. Okay, uh, so. Uh, so what I have here uh, on the uh, uh, on the one side is a, a driverless car, and so these are things that we're pretty familiar with by now, and will only become more familiar with. But basically, the, this is um, our you know computer technology getting to the point that it can be autonomous and uh, navigate a complex problem, uh, which is moving around the roads uh, on its own uh, without us. And uh, this is a good thing for us to think about to try to understand the mind because uh, modern uh, science tells us that the mind is a computational system. Uh, we receive data about the world from our senses. These are the inputs. Uh, that data uh, goes into our brain, uh, which is our computer. We process that information. We construct a model of the world around us, all the objects surrounding us, including the people, uh, including the people's mental states and their attitudes towards us. And so we create this environment uh, in our brains. That's the world that we live in. That's our experience. Uh, and so that is, um, uh, and so we're starting to see computers do similar things in, in that they're getting to the point of being autonomous. Uh, so it's 
that it's easier for us to understand how the mind works as our computer technology improves. And regular computers have already been a huge source of insight to uh, cognitive science, but the computers that we use on our phones and our, our desktops and our laptops, they're not very autonomous. Uh, they're made to be used by us, and so they offload a lot of the decision-making process onto the humans. But the more we see autonomous robots, uh, the more we're going to see computational systems that are more similar to our minds, and it will provide an even better analogy and metaphor uh, for understanding our own behavior. Uh, so these cars are doing amazing things. Uh, they have um, uh, very complex uh, software systems with millions and millions of lines of code, uh, th you know, thousands, tens of thousands of algorithms within that code, uh, making uh, it possible just to simply drive around the, uh, around the road, which any teenager uh, can do. So we think of this as simple, but as we take on these challenges, we realize you know, how complex it is. Now, next to that, I have an ant, which uh, has a brain, uh, which is also a computer, and the ant solves the same kinds of problems uh, that our autonomous cars uh, do. It navigates around the world, uh, it processes information, uh, collects data, uh, creates an internal model of the world around it. And so, uh, and the key difference between the ant and uh, current robots is that the ant's brain is far more sophisticated than any computer that a human has ever built. Uh, so this is what we're dealing with when we're dealing with brains. We're dealing with the most uh, complex and sophisticated computers uh, in the universe. Uh, and so when we're trying to think about the evolution of the mind, we have to have a little bit of humility because we're talking about computer systems that are far beyond our current comprehension. Uh, we're currently getting closer and closer, but if you look at our most advanced robots, they're not nearly as agile uh, as an ant. Uh, or a fly, or a bird, or a squirrel. And so the brains in, uh, that animals have uh, are still the best computers uh, that we know of. Uh, and so we, so we have to go into thinking about the mind uh, with a certain amount of humility and realizing uh, that evolution is, cre is, is quite competent uh, at programming. And we can't go into it assuming that we know uh, what its limits are. Um, and so that's kind of the key point. So, uh, so the idea is that the mind is made of algorithms. Uh, this is modern science. It's not spirits or a soul. It's not inanimate forces, uh, like uh, you know, various kinds of irrationality that bounce into each other. Uh, that's not a, a very good description of what the mind's doing. Uh, it's made of millions of algorithms uh, that are in thousands of programs. The algorithms are goal-seeking. They receive inputs, they process them, and then they generate outputs that are going to be uh, useful to us. And this is often called the computational theory of mind. Uh, and it's a, a, one of the main uh, foundations of evolutionary psychology. Now, when we look at our brains and see that we can do all these amazing things, we can walk around better than a robot can. Uh, we can see uh, better than a robot can. Uh, we, we know what to eat. We know when to go to sleep. And so these are the amazing things that our minds are doing. And we ask, well, how, do, how does it know all this stuff? Uh, well, they were designed by natural selection. So that's the process we have to look at to understand the structure of these algorithms uh, in our minds. So selection favored algorithms that solve common problems uh, that promote our health and reproduction. And so ultimately, of course, in evolution, it's reproductive success. But there's many things that you have to do before reproducing. Uh, and so even more generally, it's about promoting our health because if you're not healthy, you're not gonna get to the point of reproduction anyway. Uh, so on a day-to-day -day basis, these algorithms are doing things like keeping you from falling off a cliff or uh, slipping down the stairs and that's to maintain your health. Okay. And this includes social problems. So we not only have to navigate the stairs, we also have to navigate uh, our friends and family uh, members and our uh, students and our professors uh, and uh, all, the, all of the people that we interact with. And when we think about how natural selection is going to shape these algorithms, the relevant field there is evolutionary biology. It tells us how natural selection works and how it shapes uh, all the traits that an animal has including the algorithms in its brain. So let me just remind you some things that we know algorithms can do. 
uh, from computer science. Uh, we already know that algorithms are capable of this. And remember, evolution is better than the best computer programmers. Mm -hmm. So whatever human programmers can do, evolution could, in principle, do as well. Uh, so there's no reason to think that because our mind is based on algorithms that it's limited in a certain way. It, it's actually beyond our comprehension uh, what its limits are. Okay, so we know algorithms can behave. Uh, they can drive a robot and move its body around. They can calculate costs and benefits. They can evade obstacles. They can navigate a landscape. They can learn new things. They can copy uh, others. They can communicate. They can cooperate. They can outwit an opponent. They can modify themselves. They can invent new algorithms. They can invent new ideas. They can solve new problems. So these are all things that we know that algorithms, computer systems, purely physical systems can do. Uh, they can create new music. Uh, they can create, uh, solve math problems that humans can't uh, solve. Okay. And so when we think of what, how did evolution shape our minds? Um, there's no reason to put a limit on what, it can, what evolution put in our minds. It could put all of these things in our minds. There's no reason to think that evolution can't make us inventive and be able to invent particular uh, new things. In fact, we, should, we can guarantee that it, it uh, allows us to do that. Uh, so, you know, as I said, uh, evolution's algorithms outperform our own best algorithms. Uh, a great example is birds' uh, flight controllers. Uh, every time you see a, a bird, just remember this is an amazing computational system, far beyond anything humans have been able to program, uh, and that that's what we should be thinking about when we're thinking of something like morality. Uh, how did evolution build morality? Well, it could be as complicated as flight controllers, uh, meaning it could be uh, uh, quite beyond our comprehension uh, how sophisticated this is. It doesn't mean that evolution put in just a couple rules, you know, don't kill, don't steal, don't lie. Uh, that would be a, quite a simple uh, computational system. Uh, it, birds flight controllers are far more sophisticated than that, and there's every reason to think that human morality is as well. And so evolution is more innovative and creative than the smartest humans. And we have to remember that when we're talking about an evolutionary perspective uh, on the mind. We're not just looking for sort of dumb heuristics, we're looking for some of the most sophisticated programs uh, uh, in the universe. Uh, could I just interrupt you please, there for a second? Please. Because yes. uh, you referred to algorithms, uh, and since we're going to talk about morality today, I mm -hmm. guess that it's very important for people to have this clear in their minds. So when sure. in evolutionary psychology, we're trying to understand how our minds work and how these algorithms that we evolved work, uh, we're referring mainly to the computational operations that happen in the mind in terms of the types of informational inputs that uh, these algorithms uh, process, right? And, and then how they work, how they process those types of information and also the kinds of outputs that they give mainly in terms of behavior. We're not really uh, uh, that interested in uh, subjective feelings, be, uh, right? Because, I mean, when we talk about, for example, moral sentiments like shame and guilt, uh, I mean, people, I guess that most people would immediately think about how they subjectively experience these sorts of emotions. But that, that's not really what matters here, right? It's much more the computational aspect of the types of information that we process, how we process them, and the kinds of outputs that we get, right? Um, yeah, so I would say, uh, I would agree with part of, I would say that's, I partly agree and, and partly disagree. And so the, uh, the, uh, the, let me start with the partly disagree is that uh, our introspections and our feelings are also the output of computational systems. And so when you feel something, that's a computational system okay. that wanted you to feel that. It, it, that was an output of a computational uh, system. Okay. Uh, so everything in our subjective experience is the output uh, of, of a, a computational system. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I think 
I think one of the issues, though, that you were getting at is that um, the best way to understand algorithms is not to introspect uh, right. very often. I mean, introspection helps. We should be observant of what our mind is doing. That's one of the main uh, tools that we use. But, um, but it's not sufficient. And the reason is because when we introspect, we only receive the output of the computational system. We don't receive the inputs or, how they're, or what they're processing. Uh, we, only, you know, we only feel angry that this happened, but we don't know why we're more angry uh, when uh, this person you know, ripped us off uh, selling us a car in one situation than another. We don't have access to those underlying algorithms that compute how angry we should be uh, in different uh, situations. Uh, so, you know, one example is we feel more angry if we are relatively stronger uh, than the other person. So if you go to buy a car and they try to rip you off, if you're relatively stronger, you'll feel angrier. If you're relatively weaker, you'll feel less angry. And this is because the emotion of anger automatically computes costs and benefits of being angry. And it knows that if you get angry and do something to them, they could retaliate. And so one of the costs and benefits that's calculated uh, is, is uh, how tough they are uh, so that you can uh, calibrate your anger uh, to that uh, situation. Now, when we, we just subjectively feel very angry or not, we don't, uh, we don't perceive that we're calculating these things. We don't uh, you know, measure someone's bicep uh, as we're deciding how angry to feel. Uh, these are happening uh, automatically uh, and unconsciously. So yeah, so it's true that we can't fully understand morality uh, or any behavior uh, through introspection. And the reason is because our experience only has a piece of, of um, what's going on and it represents the output of computational systems, but it does not show us what's under the hood and what, which costs and benefits were factored in, into that uh, experience. Mm -hmm. And just one, one more thing. I, I think I was also talking about, even though I didn't perhaps articulate it uh, as I should, um, but uh, maybe I was also thinking about the causal relationships there, because I guess that uh, most people, common people, I mean, people that are not aware of evolutionary psychology approaches and things like that, they would think that it is the subjective experience, that feeling that they have, that causes the behavior. But it's not really, right? It's the computational process that goes around mostly at a subconscious level. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would say uh, that that's right. Um, I mean, mostly it's the, our experiences correlate with our behavior uh, because our feelings are one of the outputs and then our behaviors are another part of the output. Mm -hmm. But there's certainly feedback between these things. So sometimes you get the output, uh, which is anger, and that, but then that anger becomes accessible to many other computational systems. And so other computational systems will calculate, okay, some, you know, my anger motivation wants me now to attack this person. What are the consequences of that? Will they call the police? Uh, will I get arrested? Uh, and so, you know, so once uh, the anger system computes a certain level of anger, that information becomes accessible to many other systems uh, in the mind, and those all check uh, what it's suggesting to do against other factors. So there's a, a, a sort of a recursive processing uh, that's going on. And, um, and that that is so in that sense uh, our subjective feelings do have a causal role in our behavior that's why we have them um, but it's just not you know quite as straightforward it's, it's not that we sit and rationally decide and then do something it's that we unconsciously come up with a feeling that appears to be our rational decision that gets processed more which leads to the next uh, thought or feeling uh, and in this sort of circular process processing uh, we, you know, we end up making decisions and, and choosing uh, behaviors. Uh, so the subjective feelings are in there somewhere, but they're not the sort of prime mover of, of what's happening. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you for clarifying. And if you want to continue with your slides now. Okay, great. Yeah, so, um, so, yeah, so just to sort of, I thought it would be good to uh, clarify this common misconception that evolution does not produce only simple fixed instincts. A lot of the early work on morality figured that if evolution has anything to do with it, then it would just give us a set of 10 things you shouldn't do, and that's about it. Uh, so that's 
we shouldn't limit our imagination to that because we have many, many examples of evolution doing much more complex things than that. Uh, in fact, there's no known limit to the complexity and creativity of evolved cognition and behavior. Uh, and then this brings us to social behaviors. And uh, so just like all the rest of our behaviors, social behaviors are driven by high performance algorithms that are capable of learning, strategy, improvisation, uh, and invention. So they're not just stuck on one thing, just you know, repeating one thing. They can invent uh, new moral rules, uh, new strategies. Uh, so they're not well described as fixed uh, instincts, which is a common misunderstanding that if we're talking about evolution, we're talking about fixed instincts or simple heuristics. That's just, there's just no reason to limit our imagination to that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then when we get to the social mind, uh, that we should think of the social mind as made of strategies. Uh, and in evolutionary biology, as you and your readers are well aware, uh, we talk a lot about strategies, the so tit for tat uh, in the prisoner's dilemma, uh, bourgeois strategy in the hawk dove game. And so we have these games that model fighting, uh, cooperation, negotiation, uh, all of these interesting situations, uh, cooperation in groups. Uh, and, and we analyze and look at the different strategies, uh, often using uh, game theory. Uh, that would be performed better or worse uh, in these situations. And so the social world is made of strategies, whether you're a macaque uh, monkey or you're uh, you know, signing the Declaration of Independence in the U.S., uh, then you're, uh, we're, we live in a social world. We're surrounded by other humans. They're part of our environment. Those, humans have, those other humans have strategies, and so we have strategies uh, in response. Uh, and so this is what the mind is made of. And so most theories in the social sciences, ideally, should be about our strategies. If they're leaving out strategy, and so say you have a theory about, say, risk preferences, uh, or about you know, framing or priming that has just no strategy in sight, they're probably missing some of the most important things. Because we are a social animal. We form you know, dominance hierarchies, we trade with each other, we have friends, uh, we have family members, we negotiate, we argue. These are all strategies uh, that our minds are, are using. And so when we're talking about social behavior, we should be talking about strategies. If strategies are nowhere in the picture, we've, we've probably gone off uh, the, the deep end uh, somewhere. Okay. So, uh, so that's the basic... Uh, set up I wanted to do to give some background. So now I'm ready to get to morality. Was there anything else about that that, that uh, you wanted to talk about or does, does that all seem straightforward? Uh, are you going to address moral condemnation and moral Yeah, judgment? yeah, yeah. So now I'm going to get to morality. So that we're zeroing in. So we started with the mind as a computational system. Then we got to social world. Now we're getting to morality. And so we're going to use those tools. We're going to think about morality as computational and made of strategies. Okay. 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 So to start us off, I wanted to uh, list a bunch of words that kind of show how complex morality is, and that it's not quite clear what we're talking about when we just say the word morality, uh, because there's so many different aspects uh, that relate to it. And so I just have a big list of stuff here, and we, the list could go on, we could make other things, but this is just to say that we can't just think of morality as one uh, thing. We often think of morality as a thing that makes us nice, that makes us good, and that's certainly an aspect of it. And so altruism is the first one. And in evolution, we've, uh, evolutionary biology, we talk about altruism uh, the most. Uh, but here's you know, many other things uh, that are uh, related to morality. Uh, Nonviolence, you know, just not hurting each other, uh, not, which means not quite, you don't have to be nice, it's just, you're just not hurting. Uh, honesty, so communication, that's uh, separable from altruism. Uh, property, uh, ownership, something's mine, uh, something's yours, uh, loyalty uh, to, uh, to our groups uh, or uh, to a, a high status uh, individual, authority, uh, so having uh, differences in status, uh, having concerns about obedience, disobedience or oppression on the other side, uh, chastity, uh, so everything uh, surrounding sexual morality, sexual taboos. I didn't even list food taboos, but that's another uh, huge one uh, that we see across uh, many different cultures. Uh, so, so those are all within the umbrella of morality. 
Then at the top of the next column, we have explicit rules. Uh, so morality isn't just the stuff, uh, th those other things. It's also that we make uh, explicit rules. We say, you can't do this, you must uh, do that. And we, we state them uh, in language and we argue uh, over them. Many of our rules are destructive. Uh, so, uh, uh, so morality can be uh, very harmful. And so an obvious one uh, is uh, uh, hate crimes uh, for, uh, say, uh, attacking uh, people for homosexuality or uh, harassing uh, women who are seeking abortions uh, or uh, sex workers uh, who uh, need uh, contraception. Uh, so, uh, so these are, are uh, things that we see a lot or, say, prohibition against uh, charging interest, uh, which uh, inhibited economic uh, progress for a long time. Uh, so that's another thing we see. We see a conscience, uh, which is when we think about uh, moral rules in, in relation to our own behavior. So we decide, should I tell a lie or not? Uh, and so we evaluate this, reason about it, deliberate about it. Uh, prohibitions, uh, saying things other people uh, can't do, uh, punishing other people uh, for doing things that are morally wrong. Uh, we see punishment reach the level of executions, actually murdering people uh, because they've done something morally wrong. Often the things that they're doing wrong are not uh, nearly as bad as murder itself. Uh, and so that we should say is sort of puzzling. Why are humans uh, killing people because they had sex with the wrong person, uh, uh, according to the, uh, to the attacker? Um, and or because they, uh, you know, uh, believe in a, di a different uh, religion, and so we execute them. Okay, so this is just a, a strange and intense uh, thing that we see humans doing. We have moral dilemmas, uh, many situations that are easy to construct where we can't tell what the morally right thing is, and no philosopher can convince us or each other. Uh, we have moral debates. We love to argue about what's right and wrong. Uh, it's in the newspaper every single day. It's uh, a huge part of political uh, discourse. Uh, and we invent new moral rules. So a new technology comes out, say genetically modified foods, and we're off to the races arguing about uh, the morality of, of uh, new technology. So we invent new rules. So all of these things are under the umbrella of morality. And so for someone who wants to approach this, you know, from a scientific perspective, there's just first sort of this uh, blurry mass of stuff, and it's not quite clear uh, where we're supposed to focus our attention. And uh, so one of the first things someone should do is try to, if they're trying to come up with a theory, is try to figure out which piece they're uh, going after, and not to, for example, imagine that altruism encompasses the entire sphere. I mean, there's just so much other things going on besides uh, altruism. Uh, in uh, morality, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna get to just, yes. so Let me just ask you one quick question here. Uh, uh, do any of these aspects that you're referring to of morality here do they fall under specific uh, cognitive modules of the mind that go associated with morality? Are are any of them uh, modules themselves or or not? Uh, so. Uh, yeah, I would say, I mean, basically all of them are different modules uh, where some of them are over, you know, overlapping and some are inputs to others. Uh, so, um, uh, so, you know, so our punishment systems are, are, might take inputs from like a sy systems that uh, process like others' honesty. Uh, and so, so anyway, there, yeah, there are many computational systems and that's kind of the point is, Morality almost covers all of social life. And so, of course, there's going to be probably dozens or hundreds, maybe thousands of different uh, programs for managing social life. And morality is at the intersection of that. And it's got many different pieces, many different components. And it takes inputs from other components that aren't about morality, but they tell it things like who you're related to. So, right, a kinship system is going to track who your family is and who someone else's family is. But then to make a nepotism judgment, you need input from the kinput, uh, kinship tracking system into the moral system. Uh, so, so there's much uh, crosstalk uh, between many uh, programs here. And uh, basically, just as soon as we see all this complexity and these patterns, these are consistent patterns found in every society. Uh, as soon as we see this kind of complexity, uh, that's, a, that's a big clue that there's 
there's a, a whole lot of uh, computational systems uh, underlying this. Mm -hmm. So there are different cognitive modules that fall under the rubric of morality and yeah. they also get some feeding from other cognitive modules that don't necessarily are, that are not necessarily exclusive to morality. Exactly, yes. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, um, and, and I'm going to organize all of those in a second. Um, so, I started by brainstorming, just putting them all out. Um, but I thought I would walk you through my version of the history of the evolutionary study of, of uh, morality. And so, what I say here is this is the first generation, begins with Darwin, uh, and then continues up to the modern day with people like Dawkins, uh, Ridley, uh, Wright. And this um, basically thinks about morality as altruism and comes up with theories of altruism. And these theories are very important because altruism is a huge part of social life. Um, what I'm going to end up questioning is how much, if, if that really explains morality or if it explains more just altruism itself, which is, it, which is a, a hugely important topic, whether or not, uh, you know, to, regardless of how close it connects uh, to our moral judgment. Um, and so the first generation is thinking about kin selection, since this gets us being nice to our family members, uh, and reciprocity, uh, since that gets us being nice to people who, uh, uh, who aren't family members. And so we're trading favors. Uh, mutualism is another uh, kind of form of, uh, sort of a form of reciprocity. And there are many elaborations of this, and I can just list a bunch of things in case people have heard of them. You know, there's signaling theories where you're being nice to show off. There's indirect reciprocity. You're being nice to those who are nice to others. There's group selection. Uh, there's strong reciprocity. There's partner choice. There's punishment of cheaters. There, there are further elaborations. So this, this is a quite a large set of theories. Uh, they, is, they're all talking about altruism. So they're saying, how can altruism evolve, which is a, a fascinating uh, topic in evolutionary biology. Um, but the, the thing that I'm noting is that that's just one piece of morality. So we're going to uh, see some others. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what I call the second generation is the idea that morality is more than altruism. It includes altruism for sure, but that's only one uh, piece. And for this, I would point to uh, Haidt's uh, moral foundations as kind of the most well-known in moral psychology. And that was in, uh, also influenced by Fisk's uh, relational models uh, theory. And so Haidt uh, has five foundations, uh, or more recently, six, but he's not committed to a certain number. What he is committed to is that there's more than care or altruism. Uh, and so, and, and I, to me, that's a, a very clear advance uh, beyond the previous uh, generation. Uh, and so, in addition to care and altruism, there's also uh, fairness, uh, which is which he thinks of as based on reciprocity and partner choice. Uh, there's authority, which is uh, based on our uh, human tendency to make uh, hierarchies, uh, like many other animals that have dominance hierarchies. Uh, there's loyalty to our in-groups, uh, which is based on our coalition psychology. And then there's uh, the purity uh, foundation, which is based on our uh, emotion of disgust uh, and our uh, sexual jealousy. And so each of these have different evolutionary roots. And, I, and uh, you could say that there are five you know, different modules. Uh, or at least rough categories of, of modules. Um, but basically, the second generation got us past uh, only thinking about altruism and realizing, hey, there's some other things we need to talk about. Uh, because when there's, say, food taboos, and someone is very offended that someone ate pork or beef, uh, it's very hard to say that that's altruism. Uh, people have done it. That That's uh, sort of one of the big games in, in philosophy, is take any crazy moral rule and tell a concocted story where it ultimately makes everyone better off. Um, but those are pretty twisted stories and, and there's just more and more examples of moral judgments that don't uh, remotely fit altruism. Uh, so so it's, uh, that approach really isn't working. Uh, so, uh, but something to notice about all of these behaviors uh, that uh, I uh, talked about is that they're all found uh, for the most part, uh, in other social animals. So the authority foundation is not remotely unique to humans. Uh, you know, hyenas have dominance hierarchies. 
uh, baboons have dominance hierarchies, chimpanzees, uh, and then uh, you could find reciprocity in other species, partner choice in other species, you can find in-group loyalty, group competition, you can find ants fighting each other in groups, uh, you can find disgust, sexual jealousy. So all these things uh, you can find pretty widely across uh, different uh, animals. So we're not yet getting to anything that's uniquely human uh, in our morality, but we certainly expanded well beyond uh, you know, ordinary uh, altruism. Mm -hmm. So what I would say is the next generation uh, is that morality is explicit rules of action that are layered on top of altruism, authority, chastity, and etc. Uh, so those are part of morality because that's what the rules are about. Uh, but they're, they're not act, I, I would reserve the term morality for the layer above them, which is the explicit rules. So when we state what the rule is, that you have to share food with someone who's hungrier than you. Uh, when we say that that's the rule, that the rich have to share with the poor, in that example, uh, then we're making an explicit rule, and that's, to me, that's when it becomes distinctive to humans. Uh, it adds an entire level of, of new strategies. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we can choose, do we want to use a word to mean all the stuff on that first slide, or do we want to uh, try to pick out the most important pieces? And I would say that, that the most important piece is the rules about these things, uh, not the things themselves. Uh, so morality is not the same as altruism, honesty, authority, and so on. Uh, it's about those uh, behaviors. Uh, the morality layer includes Kantian rules of action, uh, so prohibitions that say it's immoral to lie regardless of the consequences. And so there the focus is on lying, which is an action, uh, rather than the consequences and saying, you know, do what's best for everyone else. That's, that's not how it works. It, it focuses on the action. Uh, it's, it includes punishment of violations, so when someone uh, steps over the line uh, on, on these rules, then we want to punish them. Uh, it includes debates over the rules, should the rich share with the poor or not. Uh, we can debate that. People have been debating that one uh, uh, through all of human history. Uh, and it includes inventing new rules, so when the new uh, technology uh, comes out, human cloning, time to invent some new uh, rules uh, for that. Uh, it's mostly unique to humans. For instance, uh, as far as I know, no other animals have moral debates. Uh, they do a lot of these behaviors. They communicate honestly. But I don't know of any species that debates whether you should communicate honestly or not. So the rule is not an explicit one. And so you're not going to have debates and someone coming up with a rival rule and saying, well, I think you can lie under this circumstance. And I think that should be the rule. Uh, there's no debate like that, mostly because the rules aren't explicit. So how can you debate them? And so this is a very important part of human morality. I think uh, it would, human morality would be unrecognizable without it. So try to imagine what morality would look like if there was no debates, uh, if we were just honest and altruistic, and, uh, but had no rules, never argued about them. We just all agreed on these things. It wouldn't look like human morality, right? So, so I think this is a very important uh, piece. Uh, that, that should be in our uh, theories. So to me, this is the sort of the, the latest uh, generation of theories uh, is focused on that. And here I just put it into a, a diagram of the way I think about it is I think of the lower la layer, I think of these as pre-moral because these are the social behaviors that morality is about, but we could have all of these behaviors without having moral rules or debates or anything like that. And that's what we see in many other animals. So many animals engage in honest communication, but those, uh, the, but those do not have a rule that says you should be honest or, or debate over when you can lie and when you can't. Um, so all the things uh, on the, what I call the lower layer are behaviors that we see in many animals. They're very important ones in human social life, especially because we're so social. So property is a huge uh, part of our social life, loyalty, authority. Uh, various sexual behaviors and, and uh, opinions about those. Uh, so, but to me, this is kind of a pre-moral area because we could have all of these things and still not have rules, and then it really wouldn't be morality in my sense uh, of the term. So then we have the mid-layer, which is about the lower layer. And so that's why these things have been easy to confuse. We have rules about altruism, so then we've 
confuse the two and said, oh, the rules are altruism. No, the rules are about altruism. It's the difference between a painting and the tree that the painting uh, depicts. Okay, so altruism is what the painting depicts and the, the rules are the painting. Okay. So, uh, so the mid layer is explicit rules that you have to do this, you can't do that. Uh, it includes destructive rules uh, that go against altruism, that uh, 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 reduce people's welfare. It includes conscience when we use these rules to uh, think about our own behavior. And conscience isn't the only way to be altruistic. You can be altruistic without considering any rules, just because you want to be nice, because this is your family member or it's your friend, uh, uh, or you just you care about others, uh, then that those are altruism mechanisms that can that can proceed entirely independently of any moral rule. But when you do consider moral rules and say, wait a minute, it would be wrong for me to uh, sell a car that doesn't work uh, to a stranger, uh, that's conscience uh, kicking in and applying uh, these rules to your own uh, behavior. Uh, so. This, the explicit rules are often prohibitions, sometimes also uh, oblig obligations. It includes execution, and it includes the extreme of, of, um, of uh, you know, ex executing uh, people uh, uh, when they've crossed these uh, lines. So I think of that as the mid layer. And then the top layer is, um, is when we're actually debating the rules. And so the top layer is about the mid layer, because if you don't have rules, then you can't debate what the rules are. And so the, de the dilemma or the debate is over what the rules are. And so that has to be a higher level. And that's, to put it also in module language, uh, since we talked about that, uh, you can think of these layers of modules. And so you can't have a, a module that's for moral debate if you don't have it uh, uh, receiving uh, inputs and taking representations from a mid-layer that has explicit rules to begin with. Same thing with a moral dilemma. Those are situations where we're not sure which rules apply. The two rules come into conflict uh, with each other. And we couldn't have a moral uh, dilemma if we didn't have the rules to begin with. Uh, so the top layer depends on uh, the mid uh, layer. Similarly, for inventing new rules, that's a process that I would say is a higher level process than just the rules that, uh, themselves. Uh, so this is, this is how I uh, think of uh, the, the different phenomena. And I, my ideas have mostly focused on the mid layer of uh, moral judgment and then sometimes the top layer. Uh, but the lower le level I think of mostly as something that's pre-moral and just all of the different social strategies that we have uh, before we get to the point of, of, um, of uh, making and debating uh, rules. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me just ask you two quick questions. The first yeah. one is, uh, in the mid layer you refer to explicit rules. Is it the case that because uh, other animals uh, also have a set or a repertoire of evolved moral behaviors that uh, because uh, in certain social situations they tend to prefer certain types of behavior for themselves and for others, uh, could we say that they in a sense have some sort of implicit rules or not? Yeah, exactly. Yes, they, they have implicit uh, rules. Um, but if you don't make it explicit, then you can't argue over it. So yeah, they are certainly uh, you know, uh, using implicit rules to make their decisions. I mean, the other thing uh, is to be try to be precise about is, um, is these are rules of action. And that's a very strange format uh, for a decision making system to take. There are actions that you are prohibited from taking, you know, say lying, uh, or um, or that you're obliged uh, to take, say repaying a debt. Uh, so, um, so the fact that these rules are about actions is a very strange thing because usually decision systems are not about actions; they're about consequences, and so they aim for uh, proximate goals for consequences, you know, like avoiding you know, falling over a cliff. Uh, and so they're uh, consequentialist uh, mechanisms. They evaluate the likely outcomes of different things. And they're blind to which, they don't care which action, they choose whichever action will achieve the goal uh, that, that they're uh, seeking. Uh, so, so they're not only explicit rules, they're also explicit 
prohibitions and obligations about actions. And that's a kind of a strange format uh, for, uh, to take. Uh, all of the things on the right, uh, altruism, honesty, property, loyalty, all of that can happen with systems that are not rules of action, uh, that are, that are goal-oriented systems that uh, try to you know, defend your property or try to deliver benefits to others. Um, and uh, so, uh, so anyway, so yeah, so that's a sort of an odd feature of, uh, and that, that it stands out. So that's what we should be thinking about to try to understand it is what is this, this strange format uh, that moral uh, judgment takes. Mm -hmm. Yes, and my second question would be, so uh, when we move on to the mid layer and then to the top layer, um, in contrast with other animals in humans, we also have to consider the role that culture plays, right? I mean, in other animals, maybe if they are exposed to different ecological circumstances, then they deploy different types of behavior to deal with uh, slightly different problems. But in humans, we also have to consider the layer of culture and how it influences, for example, how people create moral norms or social norms systems of law and things like that right yes absolutely uh, so uh, so yes yeah, so uh, even to do the mid layer a child needs to learn what the local rules are uh, and the top layer includes inventing rules and debating rules which means new rules can be made at any time and previous rules can be suppressed uh, and, and overridden. Now what this would mean is if a child was unable to learn new rules or learn the local rules, they would not fare well in the social world. Uh, they'd be quickly out of date on, on what's considered a, a horrible thing to do and what's considered uh, uh, okay. Uh, and so um, a child, or if we just tried to design a moral robot, it would need to be able to learn what the local rules are. And then it would also have to be able to evaluate those rules. And then also, if it wants to participate in debate, it's going to have to judge which rule is better for itself uh, and then argue for the rules that are uh, uh, better for themselves. Uh, so, uh, and that, so that's where all the cultural processes uh, take place. You know, culture uh, invention is a huge uh, part of culture uh, because uh, that's what is the source of, of new uh, ideas. Uh, and then since groups... If groups are separated, invention means that one group is going to end up with different inventions than another group, uh, just by the chance processes involved uh, in invention. Mm -hmm. uh, and, then, and then people are going to have to copy rules from others, uh, and then they're going to have to debate the rules and do things like measure, uh, is this rule, you know, do most people follow this rule right now, which is very important strategically, because if you choose a rule that no one else follows, well, you're going to end up uh, ostracized, you're going to end up getting attacked by everyone who has a different sense of morality uh, than you do. Uh, so strategically, you need to keep a, keep track of how uh, what everyone else's moral rules are, how consistent they are, uh, and uh, and whether it makes sense for you to you know abide by it or to be a rebel and, and try to take on and, and uh, change uh, that rule. And so those are all cultural processes. They're all expected to lead different groups to uh, different sets of moral rules, uh, because just like we have different physical technologies, uh, uh, different our ability to invent uh, things like hammers and arrows and canoes, uh, we're inventive. So different groups are gonna have different physical technologies in the same way we'll have different moral uh, technologies. Mm -hmm. Okay, I understand. So if you want to move on to the next slide then. Okay. Okay, so, so that's kind of an overview of all the different uh, topics and kind of how they fit together. I, I uh, focused on this uh, mid-layer of moral condemnation, moral judgment uh, based on the rules. And um, this is just a slide that reminds us that morality involves executions. So it's not only good stuff. There's also a fair amount of bad stuff uh, we can find. And a lot of my thoughts have centered on the bad stuff probably just because so many previous authors you know, have wondered how does morality keep society together uh, and you know, get us to be nice to each other. And so that's a good topic too. I just tended to say, well, what, isn't this pretty unexplored? What about all these uh, terrible things that morality does? Uh, you know, uh, as an example, you know, terrorism, 
uh, researchers that have gone and interviewed terrorists. Uh, it's based on moral beliefs. It's based on moralistic uh, beliefs. Um, all the you know fighting historically over different religions has to do with moralizing our beliefs. And so this is one. This is a very important thing. We can't just brush aside as this little accident that happens sometimes. You know, we kill people over the uh, over their behaviors. Um, I think it happens enough that it should be you know taken seriously. Uh, and then. Another example, uh, I saw you had uh, Peter Singer on recently, who is uh, someone that I, I follow uh, also. And uh, so this is an example uh, from him, which is about uh, omissions. And just this is just another example of something I think is destructive uh, about our moral judgment in a more subtle way, uh, which is that our, since our moral judgment focuses on actions, omissions often go under our moral radar. Uh, so we don't feel bad if we enjoy a luxury vacation or a lug or a, a, a dinner uh, even if there's other people who are starving uh, at the same time or you need water and medicine uh, that those same resources could have gone uh, to help we don't feel bad about that because we haven't stole stolen anything from them or or uh, we didn't we didn't take any actions that put them in that situation so we don't feel bad because our moral judgment is so focused on actions but arguably, this is a huge blind spot uh, in our moral judgment. Uh, and if we were pure consequentialists, we would never miss this. Uh, it would be very obvious uh, that uh, uh, that. And so basically, uh, 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 omitting to help someone who's starving would have the exact same moral weight as taking food and leaving them to starve uh, if, if our minds worked differently. But since we're so focused on actions and we think, well, I didn't do a bad action, I didn't cross any lines, then we don't feel bad uh, as other people uh, are uh, suffering around the world. So that's a kind of a more subtle destructive aspect. And then another one uh, to point out that's you know, probably closer to home uh, for most of us is that if you observe in everyday life where moral discourse enters in, You'll find that it's often happening in arguments um, with people we know within our families, with our friends, uh, with our colleagues. We're often having moral arguments about you know, what's fair, uh, what's not fair, whether it was wrong for them to do this or that. And if you look at those arguments, what I think you'll find if you just observe and just try to track what's happening in those, um, in those discussions, I think that what you'll find is that uh, the role of morality is to escalate fights in most situations. People start pointing fingers at the other person and saying, you're in the wrong. What you did was wrong. And that often escalates fights because it's a threat to their reputation that I'm saying you're immoral. Um, and if I went and told everyone else this, uh, it would damage your reputation. Other people would uh, join me in punishing you uh, for this behavior. So making a moral accusation is a threat uh, against someone. Uh, and so what we find is that people actually get along better uh, when they focus on consequences instead of which actions are right or wrong. And so what it means to focus on consequences is people's welfare. How did you feel when this happened? How did it affect you when that happened? How can we make a deal and compromise? Uh, how can we both reach an outcome uh, that's better? Uh, so often when we put down morality and pick up compassion, uh, we actually get along better. So even within our interpersonal relationships, uh, it's not clear that morality improves them. Uh, very often it escalates fights, it turns into threats and bling. Um, so, um, so we have to consider that too, and it may be you know, a destructive aspect. Uh, and so again, just another example where we can't just think of morality as making us all nice and holding society together when it's also doing these other things. Uh, I, uh, we should take those seriously uh, as well. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so with that sort of setup of, we can ask, you know, what are the functions of moral judgment, the evolutionary functions? Um, now knowing that by moral judgment, I mean the judgments about these actions, mid-level, high-level. I mean, I'm including the destructive aspects, not just the nice ones. Uh, and we want to think of what are these for? Uh, if we wanted to say they're for you know, cooperation or holding society together, well, that's not going to fit with the destructive aspects very well. I mean, 
it, you could still go that direction. You're just going to need to make huge exceptions uh, for these things that they're just accidents that happen along along the way. Uh, but anyway, so that that's where that's where we're left with. You know, what are the functions of moral judgment? And then, so here I just kind of emphasize again that what we see this format is these prohibited actions: don't steal, don't kill, don't lie, uh, no adultery, don't believe other gods uh, except for my god, uh, and and uh, uh, so on. Uh, so these are these are the prohibited actions, and this is the sort of strange format that moral judgment takes. And I think it, this is probably the most difficult thing for humans to step back from to see how strange this is, because we're so used to it. We make moral judgments all the time. This just seems completely routine to us. It doesn't seem out of the ordinary. So let me try to give one example uh, to, to try to uh, sort of shock uh, ourselves uh, out of that view, is to compare moral judgments to prudential judgments, being careful, being cautious. And so, um, so you know, getting heart surgery is very dangerous. Uh, so is going hang gliding or uh, you know, bullfighting or even climbing a ladder is very dangerous. Uh, these are, are not prudent uh, things to do uh, in, if you don't uh, need to do them. Uh, but in the realm of prudence, we are uh, completely consequentialist. What matters is whether is the outcome, whether we get harmed or not. And so imagine someone saying that it's dangerous to, to, uh, 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 to go hang gliding. Uh, no matter how skilled you are, it's just inherently dangerous. Or it's dangerous to get on a roller coaster no matter what the track record of that uh, roller coaster is, no matter what the outcome is, or it's dangerous to get on a plane because heights are dangerous, no matter what. I mean, that would be a very bizarre thing to see, but that's what, you know, Kant's theory of morality says, it's wrong to lie, no matter what the effects. That would be like saying, you know, uh, it's wrong to uh, cross the midline with your car uh, to drive across the street, no matter what the effects. Uh, even if it helps you dodge an obstacle uh, in the middle of the road. Uh, so it just makes, this format makes no sense uh, in the realm, when you convert it to another realm of uh, prudence and being cautious and dealing with danger. But as soon as the danger involves you and someone else, we have, we have moral judgments involved. And now we bring in this other format where it's actions that you can't take. And that requires an explanation uh, because it's such a bizarre way to make a decision. And it suggests that the decision is that this must be for something strange or unusual, because if it was just for making everyone safe, then it would work the same way you make your decisions when your own safety is on the line. But now when it's other people's safety, say, you know, the trolley problem, which I'm sure you've heard of, you've probably talked about on the show. Yeah. Uh, so trolley problem, can you kill one person to save five? Well, if it was just you, can you cut off one finger to save five fingers? It's a trivial decision, right? Of course, you'd lose one finger to save five. So why, as soon as it's five people instead of five fingers, our judgments completely change? Uh, and so that is something that requires an explanation. Uh, and I'm going to end up arguing that it's a pretty sophisticated strategy that we're using uh, to coordinate with others that will help explain this. Uh, but but the common explanation is that this is a heuristic and it's got some errors along with it. So don't kill, it's a heuristic. It's not very smart, but it does the job. But this would be like saying it's a heuristic not to cut off your finger uh, to save the other five. But that's not how it works. You know? Or it's a heuristic to not get heart surgery because it's dangerous. That's not how it works. Uh, that's not how we make our prudential judgments. They're not just these you know, dumb heuristics that can't take any complexity whatsoever and just have to take an action and say you can't do it. So anyway, so that is uh, kind of a long explanation uh, to, to try to uh, hammer that home. I, I think it, that still requires more emphasis even you know, in the literature because almost everyone overlooks this aspect and it's probably the most important one uh, of uh, moral judgment. Mm -hmm. sure. So because it has this focus on actions, this setup sets up the most fundamental debate in moral philosophy uh, that I'm sure you're very aware of, which uh, where Kant is the most famous figure on the deontologist side that says some actions are wrong no matter what the consequences. 
And Mill uh, says, no, we should really be focused on consequences. We should make these decisions the same way we would make decisions about harm and danger. Uh, and we need to be able to maximize welfare, especially if we're policymakers. Uh, we can't afford to just stick to some rules. And and also, if even if we said that somehow the Kantian rules were the best, well, how are we going to decide which Kantian rules, since every group of people seems to have different sets of Kantian rules? Uh, so uh, so the consequentialist, you know, uh, has some hope for reaching uh, some uh, consensus. Uh, when people disagree. So, but this entire debate only occurs because the human mind has the concept of an action prohibition uh, for immorality and only in morality, not in our other decisions. Uh, so if, if, it was, if that wasn't the case, humans would never have had this debate. We would just be consequentialists from the start, and that would be that. Um, but because we have this concept, it sets up a philosophical debate because part of our minds are deontological, and they've got these actions. But another part is altruistic and consequentialist. Our altruism systems are consequentialist. They want to maximize everyone's welfare. We, uh, even young children automatically help others. If somebody drops a pencil, they go and pick it up and give it to them. You know, that's at like nine months old before they've learned any moral rules. So we are automatically uh, altruistic and consequentialist um, in part of our mind. But then the other, another part is deontological. So this is an inevitable clash. These two things are going to collide. Uh, and then you end up with, a, uh, uh, with moral uh, debates for you know, hundreds of years uh, because we have incompatible concepts uh, in our heads. So, so it is the case that we really have evolved uh, conflicting moral intuitions, right? Yes, absolutely. And in fact, the entire system of making explicit rules uh, allows for conflicting rules. There's nothing that says the new rule can't be in conflict with an old rule, uh, especially if the conflict is not immediately apparent and doesn't, you know, it doesn't come up until some new situation that you hadn't anticipated comes up, and then all of a sudden you say you see that do not lie is incompatible with you know do not harm uh, someone, and then uh, so these uh, the system is invents new rules for different conflicts that occur on a conflict-by-conflict -conflict basis, similar to how uh, the law sets rules on a conflict-by-conflict -conflict basis. And, you know, there's some effort at consistency when people debate, but there's no, there's no requirement of consistency, and, they, and they're routinely inconsistent uh, with each other, uh, which is why we have so much to talk about as a moral uh, species. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so my perspective on these things is to think of Moral cognition, our uh, thoughts and, and um, especially our thoughts and feelings, especially uh, cognition sort of signals that we're going to be computational about this. Again, thinking of this as uh, very sophisticated programs uh, that are calculating rel relevant costs and benefits. And we're going to think of it as strategic. Now, what does that mean, strategic? Uh, so what it means is that your best decision depends on decisions that others are going to make. That's what defines a strategic decision as opposed to just an ordinary decision. And so my example here uh, is that I've got uh, Kant, uh, Mill, and Nietzsche uh, in a strategic situation, and um, they're each thinking of the other two. And so when we think about the others that we're interacting with as we make our decision, that is what defines a strategic situation. And uh, those, that's all, those are also the basic elements of uh, game theory as opposed to decision theory. In game theory, there's other players, and each player has to consider the possible moves of the other players uh, in choosing uh, their uh, decision. And so that's the, the uh, basic framework. Uh, and uh, uh, this probably differs you know, from many uh, other approaches. Uh, philosophers often just think, our moral judgments are just sort of reason operating on their own. Uh, just not you could reason about morality by yourself on an island. Uh, but the idea is that moral cognition uh, is made for the social world. Uh, it wouldn't really make any sense on an island uh, by yourself. Uh, it's only for interacting uh, with others. Okay, so, uh, so now I'm going to narrow down to one important strategic situation, and this is the one that I think can help explain some of these puzzling features of uh, moral judgment. And it's also 
uh, a situation that comes up all the time in uh, human life, which is choosing sides in others' conflicts. So uh, just think of any time uh, that a friend of yours got into an argument with somebody, uh, two colleagues at work uh, got into an argument, or we see politicians constantly uh, fighting with each other. And in all these cases, they often look to us and say, what do you think? And will you take my side? Will you support me? So we're often in the situation of choosing sides. Uh, this is, is uh, pretty, uh, not entirely unique to humans, but we probably do it more than maybe any other species or at least uh, we're you know, at the extreme. Uh, so, you know, uh, an example would be in baboons, they don't have a problem of choosing sides because they always side with their kin against non-kin. And even within their kin, there's a hierarchy and they side with the higher rank against the lower uh, rank. So there's nothing to choose. They just, they already know what they're going to do. Uh, army ants, you know, fight with other, uh, uh, fight with other ants. They don't choose sides. They're always on their own group side. It's pretty simple. Um, you know, uh, monkeys encounter another group of monkey, same thing. They know which side they're on. They don't, there's no, uh, defectors, uh, in battles between, uh, troops of monkeys. So, uh, so chimps, we see some more complicated side taking, uh, behavior, uh, dolphins, uh, hyenas. Uh, so, so we, so some animals, you can, you can see some more complicated ones, but humans are probably the most extreme. So that means that this is a kind of problem that might give us important clues about uh, uh, human uh, thought um, because it's a very distinctive situation that we're very often in. Okay, so when we're in this situation, we have to think of how are we going to deal with it? Um, so we're a bystander now, someone else is in a conflict, and so we're, we're in the bystander role and we have to think of how uh, we're gonna deal with it. So, uh, so I've distinguished three main strategies that people use. Um, uh, so one is power, choosing sides based on status hierarchies. Another is alliances, uh, supporting those who we have a longstanding relationship with uh, against others. And the other is morality, uh, choosing sides uh, based on the actions people have taken and whoever took the more uh, morally wrong action will be outraged at and side against them, even if it happens to be our friend or family member uh, in some uh, cases. Okay, so these are the three strategies, and I'll talk about a little bit about uh, each one. So first is power, and so my example here is I've got uh, Bart uh, stealing a piece of meat uh, from Barney, and so they're arguing over a piece of meat. And we've got Nietzsche here who really likes power, so he's going to choose sides uh, based on power. Uh, and there's a bunch of other Nietzsche's and they're also making the decision the same way. And so let's just imagine that Bart was higher status than Barney. And so they all choose sides the same way. It's a pretty easy decision for them. And you can see it's a very lopsided fight. So it's cheap for them. They're not gonna, none of them are, are really gonna get hurt in this, in this fight because there's a lot on one side and a few on the other side. And in fact, most likely they won't actually fight. They'll just make a threat display towards Barney and say, Barney, your lower status, just go away, let Bart have the meat. Okay. Uh, so that's one way of choosing sides. This is something we see in humans. We also see it in hyenas uh, and uh, baboons, and some other uh, very hierarchical uh, species. Okay, so next is alliances. So now let's say it's Machiavelli uh, who is watching what's happening. And, um, uh, and so Machiavelli has a ranking of loyalties. These are his allies ranked from best uh, to worst. And so, uh, so I listed them left to right. And so Barney uh, is his best friend. This is his closest ally. Uh, and uh, Bart is next and then Nietzsche is last. He doesn't really like Nietzsche. Okay. So how did he choose these ranks? How did he make that decision that Barney's his best friend? Well he considered how these two treat him. And when he looked at Bart, he saw that Bart made him his second best friend. And so Bart often sides with Nietzsche against Machiavelli. And so that's a clue to Machiavelli that he's not at the top of Bart's list. Uh, so, uh, so that's why Machiavelli uh, doesn't have Bart at the top of his list. Now, when he looked at Barney, Barney treats Machiavelli as his best friend. 
That means Barney reliably sides with Machiavelli in his fights. Uh, so that makes Bart very valuable to Machiavelli, and that makes Machiavelli want to protect uh, uh, Barney. And so that's how he chose uh, who he's going to support. And so when we're doing alliances, we're supporting those who support us. They're more valuable to us because they support us. And this leads allies uh, to sort of uh, cyclically escalate their loyalties uh, to each other. Um, and then, um, uh, so now let's imagine that there's multiple Machiavellis making the decisions in the same way. So these are different people, but they all use that same uh, process. Now, if you... Uh, think about that process for a little while, and I've also done computer simulations to kind of uh, formalize it. What you'll find is that what will happen when both, when everyone makes decisions that, that way, is that for any given fight, they'll tend to split. Uh, one, some people will support one person, the other people will support the other. And the reason is because loyalty is limited, uh, inevitably limited. You can't be you can only be completely loyal to one person because if you're loyal to a second person, well, what happens if the first and the second are in a conflict? Who are you going to support? Uh, so loyalty is intrinsically limited. And what that means is if everybody tries to form their loyalties, then when any two individuals get into a fight, they'll each have their own supporters. And so groups will tend to split in a divisive way when everyone forms their own loyalties. Uh, and the result of this is that unlike the Nietzsche case, um, in this case, the sides are evenly matched. And that means neither side's going to back down from a threat display. Hey, we have much more than many more people on this side than you guys. Uh, and so that's often when conflicts escalate the most because both sides think they have a shot uh, at winning. Uh, and so we're going to see an escalation of the conflict. And uh, there's a very large ethnographic literature looking at how conflict works that finds that when groups are more evenly matched, uh, violence is more likely uh, to uh, escalate. And that in uh, societies where loyalties are very important and alliances are very prominent, they very often have uh, outbreaks of violence uh, that happen exactly uh, like this, where two school children get into an argument they both recruit their families, their families recruit their friends, and suddenly it's a brawl of 100 people against uh, 100 people. Uh, so, um, so anyway, so that's, this is something that, in addition to sort of this theoretical cartoon, uh, that, we, that we see very prominently uh, in uh, ethnographic research on violence. So let me just ask you one thing there. Uh, when you were talking about how people establish alliances and then when they see a conflict happening, uh, they sort of computate uh, the, the alliance that they have with each person and then decide to support one or the other. Is it the case that they, they give different weights to their own ranking system and also to the ranking systems uh, of other people in terms of the position that they occupy on those ranking systems? Do they give different weights or how does it work exa exactly? Um, yeah, I, I, if, I, if I understand your question, um, uh, yeah, there's, there can certainly be different weights. So like one thing that you might think would be an obvious weight is the power and influence of each person, right? Some people are more powerful, more influential. And so all else equal, uh, you should still probably value them more than someone who's weaker, um, even if, uh, uh, if the weaker person is a little bit more reliable. And so you just have to trade off their power against their reliability. But this still means that the weakest individual will still have allies uh, because the, their reliability is still very valuable, and they can still trade on their reliability uh, even if they're the weakest uh, individual, uh, because you'd still rather support them over someone that always opposes you, even if that person is is very tough. Uh, so yeah, so there are weightings, you know, uh, based on uh, power, strength, influence, and things like that. Uh, but one interesting thing is that uh, the weakest and you could say like most despised people. 
uh, don't get left out of the equation. They still end up uh, in there. And so this, the same is true if we just think of, um, you know, sort of undesirable qualities in people and friends. So let's say someone's very selfish and stingy. Well, normally theories of cooperation would say, well, just kick that person out. Why, why are you dealing with them? But we see selfish and stingy people in society. So why are they here? Why are they doing okay? Well, this alliance dynamic explains it because even if they're selfish and stingy, if they reliably support you, they could still be more valuable than a generous person who reliably opposes you. Uh, so there's kind of a positive spin is that you know everyone can make friends uh, because uh, if we equate friends with alliances, which is uh, what I've done, um, uh, you know, there's a there's room for everyone to make friends because loyalties are limited, and that means that even a person with no a person with no friends has a strong hand because that means they can offer complete loyalty to the first you know person uh, uh, that they meet, and which is very valuable to everybody. Uh, so, so anyway, so that's kind of the positive spin on it is you know everyone gets friends in this process as opposed to just everyone picking. The most generous, most amazing person to be, you know, the one that they adore uh, completely. Uh, that would be a different kind of of primate, a different kind of society. Uh, so uh, for us, we care about loyalty, which you know has some downsides, which is this kind of divisiveness, and has some upsides, which is uh, uh, everyone ends up getting included in the process. Mm -hmm. So that's also why people take into account the position that they occupy in other people's ranking system, right? Because if they are last place in the ranking system of the strongest person, mm -hmm. then, I mean, they should make a trade-off there because probably they can't rely on that person even though she's the strongest, right? Exactly, yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Should I go on? Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay, so what we saw in those two ways of choosing sides, which are very common, is that they each lead to a distinctive problem. Uh, actually, I, I think I didn't say the problem, so let me go back for one second to say the problem here. So the problem with this one is that Bart knows he can always count on, on, this, on the group to take his side be, uh, because they choose sides based on status. Now, because he knows that, he'll actually pick more fights. Um, instead of just a fight breaks out, he now he knows he's he can count on everyone's support. So, uh, so he says, "Oh, you have a piece of meat? I'll just take it because I can count on people's support." So the problem in this case is exploitation. Uh, the powerful individuals are going to exploit others, and so it has a good property, which is that the bystanders uh, don't have to pay the cost of fighting. Uh, but it has a bad property, which is now you've got some high status individuals uh, who are poised to exploit others. So in the Machiavelli case, uh, we saw that um, the group is likely to divisively split. We no longer have a top status person who's going to get everything they want. Um, no one gets everything they want here, but everyone pays the cost of fighting. Uh, so that's kind of that's the problem that comes up in this case. So. Here's an imaginative solution uh, to this problem, another way of choosing sides that, that can solve uh, both of those uh, theoretically. Uh, so in this case, bystanders can coordinate and take the same side based on a public signal. It's important that the signal can't be tied to individuals' identities uh, because that's what led to status hierarchies and exploitation. Uh, and so I've got a coin here because just uh, to sort of illustrate it, it could just be a coin flip. Two people get into a fight, we're not sure who's, who should win, so we flip a coin and, uh, and we just choose based on that. Now, if we go through this imagination and, and think about what would happen, well, everyone's going to choose the same side as long as we all agree uh, to do it based on the coin flip. So the bystanders aren't paying costs of fighting, we're all going to choose the same side, the other guy's going to back down, easy. Um, and we don't have someone who's incentivized to pick fights because if you pick a fight, it's 50-50. You might win, you might lose. So you're not incentivized to pick fights. So something like this could help the bystanders to conflicts solve them. They could just flip a coin and choose. Now this is a bit showing some indifference to the two uh, 
disputants because you don't really care who's right or wrong. You just and you don't care who guts the meat or not, you just care that you have a solution that gets you out of this situation. Um, uh, but yeah, but you can see how this could have some advantages for, uh, for bystanders. Uh, now, uh, people don't always flip coins. Sometimes we do some randomizing type of, of things to solve uh, disputes or you know, rituals and uh, uh, things like that. Uh, but, uh, but, and also, Obviously, there were no coins uh, in, uh, for most of our evolutionary history. So what other signal could we use besides a coin? Well, one source of public signals is the actions that the disputants have taken. Mm -hmm. If these actions are separate from the identities, then we still have the same uh, advantage of the coin. Uh, and all we need to do to be able to do this is we need to be able to recognize actions when we see them, uh, which we know humans can do, that the entire category of verbs uh, just means the names we give to actions and we're able to create verbs because our minds automatically cut up uh, other people's behaviors into discrete actions like walking, running, stealing, lying. Uh, so our minds have this ability to do that and that's actually kind of an interesting ability because uh, there's no clear boundaries where walking stops and walking ends or where lying starts and lying ends. Uh, so our, it's actually quite a, an interesting computational ability that the human mind has uh, to uh, recognize and name actions. And once we have that, if we're all watching the same fight and we all recognize the same actions, then we can, if, as long as we all saw the same events, then we can pretty reliably know that if I see it, that stealing just happened, so will other people see that stealing uh, just happened. And it doesn't matter who was doing the stealing, it just matters that we all saw that stealing happened. Once that, once that signal uh, clicks, then, uh, we can, then our strategy can be side against the person who stole. Uh, so the idea is that that's what moral judgment is for. It's for dynamic coordination, which means everyone chooses the same side. That's the coordination aspect. But we don't always side with the same person. That's the dynamic aspect. We can change which side we take based on the actions uh, that were uh, chosen. Uh, so that's the idea, is that moral judgment is for dynamic coordination. And to simplify it in this picture, I have uh, the problem that was created by alliances, uh, which is that uh, the Machiavelli split and then they're all fighting. And uh, this, along with the exploitation problem, uh, gives rise to an adaptive strategy for handling it, which is a list of actions uh, that we uh, are prohibited from taking. And if we take them, uh, the society will side against that person. Now, often in a conflict, both sides have taken a bad action. One person stole and the other person beat them up. So we have stealing and assault. In that case, uh, what our minds do is evaluate the relative severity of the actions, which is something our minds also automatically compute, not just right and wrong, but how wrong is something, which is often something that we're debating uh, a lot as well. And so that's an interesting property, uh, which didn't have to be the case. If you think of, uh, just as another example, in language, a sentence is either grammatical or not grammatical. There's no such thing as, you know, more grammatical or less. It's just it's grammatical or not. But for wrong, we, we can differentiate quite extremely from uh, murder or you know, murdering thousands of people all the way down to uh, stealing, uh, down to uh, a white lie. And so there's a, a huge gradation in all of these wrongs. And that allows us to know when a conflict happens and both sides have taken wrongful actions, we can still tell which side we should oppose. Uh, so that's the... Uh, the basic idea of, of uh, what that's for. And so I'll illustrate this uh, with Wonder Woman. And so the idea is that uh, uh, because Bart stole from Barney, took the uh, action of theft, uh, Wonder Woman's going to side with Barney against uh, Bart. And they're all uh, taking the same side. Um, but if the rule is something different, and the rules of property vary a lot across society, so it could be something different. Uh, the rule could be that someone who has meat must share with others. And maybe Barney refused to share with Bart. Maybe Bart's poor. Barney's rich. 
if the rule is that you must share with others, uh, which we find in many societies, uh, then Wonder Woman would side uh, with Bart against Barney. And so she can choose either side, uh, depending on uh, what the, the current rule is uh, in society. But they still all choose together, uh, so they're not at risk of uh, splitting uh, and ending up uh, in a conflict. And also, neither of the uh, fighters are emboldened uh, uh, to t take that same behavior uh, again, uh, since uh, they know that if they refuse to share again, that the same thing is going to happen. But it's not based on their identity, uh, so that uh, is good. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that moral judgment helps people avoid costly collisions between alliances and that observers use fighters' actions to coordinate and take the same side. So I just kind of sum, summed up, I think I've said all of this uh, um, already, but if, if we choose sides based on power, we're going to enable oppression. If we choose sides based on alliances, who we're friends with, we're going to end up splitting uh, you know, and uh, so I guess you could say uh, the political equivalent of this is political polarization, partisan, uh, partisan uh, divisiveness. That's what happens when people form alliances uh, and choose sides based on those. Uh, choosing sides based on actions allows coordination without encouraging oppression. So it's a good strategy. Uh, I should mention it's not the only one humans certainly didn't replace their other strategies. We still choose sides based on power. We still choose sides based on alliances. We just add a third tactic to the mix uh, that we can use when we find it useful. Uh, and it's often most useful when others are doing the same thing. Because if you're the only one choosing sides based on morality, uh, you'll just be left out in the cold. So it won't help you at all. Uh, this is also why we might, why we might see morality uh, sort of retracting into the background in, in certain cultures and societies at, at certain times. So if you have a, a very hierarchical society, a militaristic society, uh, say like uh, Nazi Germany, then obviously power is governing all of the side taking and morality just recedes into the background. It's just not a very relevant strategy because no one else is going to choose sides based on whether uh, the leader lied or not. They don't care if he lied. He's on top. Everyone's choosing sides based on authority. And that's the law of the land at the moment. Uh, so these, you could think of these to use sort of game theory language. These are multiple uh, equilibria. Uh, societies can go to any one of them. They are, they're usually, there's always a mixture of some combination of these. Uh, and so the side taking strategy is a new one that humans came up with that added to our previous ones uh, in order to try to get out of some of the uh, worse uh, conflicts uh, that we get ourselves uh, into. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on that before I... Uh, 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 what is the next topic, by the way? Oh, so I just have, a, a uh, I think, a two or three more slides that just say some implications of this theory, and then I think that's about it for my slides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I think you could go ahead because if uh, after you finish, if we have some minutes, some more minutes, then perhaps I would simply ask you uh, about the, that paper that you did that isn't necessarily related to morality, but the psychology of coordination and common knowledge. Just to talk a little yeah. bit about the, the role that common knowledge plays in people's coordinated behavior, let's say. Yeah, so. okay, yeah, sounds good. Okay. So, yeah, I just want to spell out some of the implications, you know, how does this theory address some of the puzzles and mysteries of morality? Uh, so so just, this just kind of spells it out. So why third party condemnation, which is what a lot of people have thought about, is why do we get so mad and outraged when someone else does something wrong to someone else, not to us? It's, when, they, when they steal from us, it's easy to understand. We don't like to be stolen from. But, but if someone steals from someone else and you don't know either of these people, you just read about it in the news, why are you feeling outraged about it? This is a puzzle uh, to uh, evolutionary psychologists. And so the idea is that this signals our side taking. So when you feel outraged, you tell everyone which side you're on in this conflict. And it also allows us to predict how other people are going to choose sides. Your feeling of outrage tells you everyone else is going to be on this side uh, in, in that conflict. Make sure you don't accidentally choose the other side uh, at that moment. Uh, it wouldn't be a good idea. 
So what about destructive morals? Why do we see people condemning things that are harmless and then even executing people for that? And so the idea is that, well, moral cognition is designed to coordinate bystanders. It's not designed to promote people's welfare. Sometimes it does promote their welfare when the rules happen to align with promoting welfare. And many of the rules do, so that's why we often think positively of uh, moral uh, rules. Uh, but there's nothing in the design that requires that. As long as bystanders know which side to take, uh, this strategy is working uh, as it's designed. Uh, and it's not designed to be nice, it's a fighting strategy. Uh, so just like fighting isn't designed to be nice, uh, moral cognition isn't designed to be nice. Uh, and we should be concerned about this because it means our moral outrage is not always going to be uh, on the positive side. It's not always going to uh, improve others' uh, welfare. So we should be reflective about our outrage and uh, ask whether it does rather than assume that it does. Mm -hmm. uh, why is it in the format of action constraints, things, actions that we can't take? And the idea is that it's a strategy based on people's actions so that it's not based on their identities. Because if it is, that's when we end up in a status hierarchy and then with uh, exploitation. Why do we see diverse moral rules across cultures? Well, because humans face diverse conflicts and we have the ability to invent new rules. So different groups are going to end up with different uh, sets of rules for all the various conflicts that they face. Why do we see uh, cultural variation? Again, different conflicts in different groups and different equilibria. Even if two groups had the same exact set of conflicts, uh, they could land on different equilibria, one favoring alliances, uh, one favoring uh, moral rules, one favoring power. Creation of new moral rules and moralization. Uh, we have that ability so that we can create new rules for new conflicts. Uh, Humans invent new technologies, we move to new areas, um, so we're, we have, uh, there's a scope for new conflicts to arise, and we have the ability to create new rules on the fly for those conflicts. Uh, universalism, realism, and moral debates, why do we think that our moral rules are the only ones, uh, or are the best ones, and others are flawed, and why do we insist that there has to be a single uh, moral uh, reality for everyone? Well, the idea is that the reason we're so concerned about that is because the function of this is to achieve consensus in conflicts. We can't achieve consensus if we just let everyone have their own rules. That would be the same situation as if we all have our, the, our own allies. So we must insist on there being a single uh, morally right thing. And we, should be, and we are very anxious when other people disagree because this is a sign that we're not going to be able to reach consensus uh, when new conflicts arise. Why is it independent from authority? Why isn't morality just what the king says, or what God says, or what some other high status uh, individual says? Uh, well, the idea is that the moral strategy is designed to be an alternative to choosing sides based on authority. Uh, it's designed to counter authority. Um, and, and uh, not to align with it. Now, sometimes they do align. A, a good trick from an authority is to say that everything they do is the morally right thing. Um, but uh, uh, so, of course, every, to get everyone on your side, you want to say that everything supports you, that allies and loyalty, authority, and morality all support you. So that's what we'll find rhetorically in arguments. Uh, but uh, if we only needed authority, we wouldn't need moral concepts. We would just have status hierarchies. Uh, punishment, why do we uh, want to see others punished? It signals which side we're on, uh, pretty important in a conflict. And part of this, unfortunately, and this is a bad part of it, is that, um, is that it inhibits our sympathy for wrongdoers. So once someone has been considered that they're a wrongdoer, they've done a bad thing, uh, that actually, our outrage inhibits our sympathy for them. We actually want to see them suffer which normally humans don't want to see. We usually want to see others happy, and we're, we usually dislike seeing others in pain. Uh, but if you think of like public executions, people lining up to see you know, a thief uh, executed, uh, that's a pretty horrifying situation, and that's enabled by our moral cognition, because if you're going to side against a wrongdoer, you're going to have to inhibit your sympathy for them uh, so that you can clearly show which side you're on uh, in the conflict. Impartiality. Uh, so the so the big uh, advantage of this strategy is that it's independent of our alliances. So it has to be impartial to work as intended. Uh, it can't just be that 
uh, you're right because you're my friend. Uh, people can act that way, uh, but that concept isn't going to persuade the other side's friends uh, to do the same thing. Uh, so the strategy is impartial. Uh, people are partial. They try to bend it as much as they can, but only up to a limit because they're trying to persuade the allies of the other person to agree with them. And you can't persuade them to agree with by saying, well, this is my friend. They say, well, this is my friend. So that's it. So you have to find some impartial uh, basis if you're going to reach agreement. And that's it. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, so I guess that we took a lot of information about human morality today. Uh, I, I mean, I understood everything that you said, I guess, and with the questions that I posed, I guess that we were able to clarify some concepts and things like that. So I hope that uh, all the listeners and viewers would also understand it. So before we go, let's just then explore another topic that, yeah. as I said, doesn't necessarily have to do with morality, but yeah. rather with how humans quarter, uh, coordinate in a social situation and when, when they're trying to do something together, right? Uh, and you wrote this very interesting paper that you published in 2014 titled The uh, Psychology of Coordination and Common Knowledge. So could you tell us uh, what common knowledge is about and then how people use it to coordinate their behavior? And it's different uh, than uh, shared knowledge, right? It's not exactly the same thing. Yes, that's that's right. Um, yeah, let me let me try to do a decent job at this. It's kind of a complex uh, topic. Um, so yeah, so uh, so uh, so this is about coordination, uh, which is a relatively understudied behavior uh, compared to cooperation, which there's been tons of uh, work on. Um, and so cooperation is based on the uh, prisoner's dilemma game, uh, which is a great uh, game. But there are many other games, and coordination is based on uh, other games. Um, so, uh, uh, so a simple coordination game would be: um, we both pick a number privately, and if we pick the same number, uh, then uh, we both uh, you get a prize. Uh, if we pick different numbers, then we get uh, nothing. So the idea here is that we both want to choose. Uh, try to choose the same thing. Uh, so do you know, do you have an idea of what number you would guess if, uh, so I, I'm going to write my number down. Um, and so you can guess a number and we'll see if you match my number. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, five. Okay, uh, so, uh, so no, I, I chose number one. And um, and the reason I chose it, I I had a uh, I cheated, so I I had a hint, uh, which is that previous research did this with people, and most of them chose number one, and so the idea is that one sort of stands out as unique as something that um, people uh, that we could reach common knowledge if you go through the different numbers of what we might both uh, choose. Um, now, there is no right answer because if I had chosen five, then five would have been the right answer. So it's just a matter of kind of a mind meld of trying to think of what's the other person going to uh, choose and then what, are they, what do they think that I'm going to choose. And so that's kind of where it gets uh, tricky is that um, it has to do with how we reason about others' minds and we're, but then those people are reasoning about our minds so it's about mind reading, which is something that we do in everyday life. As soon as you, if you see someone got irritated at you, you read their mind. You looked at their face, saw an expression, and then you projected uh, what you think they're thinking right now. Sometimes we're correct, sometimes we're incorrect, uh, but that's mind reading. But now if you know they're trying to read your mind, now you're trying to read the mind of a mind reader. Uh, and in a coordination game, you're trying to read their mind to find what they're going to do but you know they're trying to read your mind to find out uh, uh, what you're going to do. And in fact, you can go to higher and higher levels, any number of levels that you want, where you're thinking about what they're thinking about, what you're thinking about, what they're thinking about, what you're thinking, and you can do that all day long, and I have because I had to, uh, and you'll get many headaches after doing that, 
because our minds are not so good with that kind of recursive reasoning, right. probably on purpose, because that's probably your brain saying, you've gone too far, this isn't a good idea anymore. <laughs> uh, and uh, so probably we're more and more likely to be wrong the more levels we go to. So our, so it, we, it feels difficult because our, our mind is trying to tell us you're on the wrong track here. Um, but in any case, um, so, uh, so, but no matter how many levels I went to, I wouldn't know which number, uh, you're going to choose. And, um, so, uh, so common knowledge is distinct from just thinking about others' minds because it has this recursive aspect where you're thinking about their minds, about your mind, about your, their mind. Uh, so, um, so common knowledge refers to uh, information that that we think that we're both sort of simultaneously know and that we could both act on simultaneously. And uh, it is what philosophers say is that imp it implies an infinite number of levels of I know that you know that I know that you know. And so if I think one is a good solution to this problem, which it turns out it wasn't in this in our particular uh, game, uh, then what I'm the way my mind is thinking of it is that th this one is potentially common knowledge, which would imply an infinite number of levels that uh, I'm going to choose one. I think that you think I'm going to choose one, and we can go up the levels uh, like that. And so, um, so it's kind of a logical puzzle and problem is that um, no finite number of levels would be enough uh, to solve even the simplest coordination problem. Um, uh, so what this means for psychology is that since humans are actually very good at solving these problems, and so we bring pe participants in the lab, we have them play coordination games, they do very well, they do much better uh, than chance, uh, they do much better than if they were only uh, guessing the other person's preference, um, and so people are good at it. Uh, and there's, uh, but game theory says people should be bad at it because a purely rational agent is bad at it uh, because they can actually rationalize any of the choices uh, because they're all possible solutions. Any number is a possible solution. And so that leaves you with nothing if you're too rational about it. Uh, so, um, so, in order, so since people do solve it, they must be able to, uh, they must have some tactic. And so, um, so we think they're reasoning about common knowledge, which is this concept uh, from game theory. Uh, and what that means is they don't actually go to the infinite levels, but, um, uh, but they have a, uh, a, mental, a mental representation of information that they presume is common knowledge. So they presume that it implies all those levels. Uh, and in order to make that determination, they have to use cues, things like how rare is it. So the fact that number one is rare uh, makes it better uh, than, uh, than other uh, numbers. Uh, so we use things like how rare is it? How conspicuous is it? Does it stand out to your senses? Um, and, uh, and some other cues like that to try to figure out uh, what's uh, common knowledge. Uh, but we need to do these things. Say you're just walking down the street and trying to decide which side of the, uh, of the sidewalk uh, to go on to avoid someone else who's walking the opposite direction. That's a coordination problem. And so you have to try to guess uh, what they're going to do. And so you're going to both try to use common knowledge uh, to solve that problem. Usually it'll work. Sometimes it won't work. Um, but these are the thought processes uh, that we use. Uh, and um, yeah, so there's all sorts of coordination problems, uh, even choosing a time for a meeting or uh, if you get separated uh, and have to find each other uh, in a crowd. Uh, and then you look around for landmarks that you think the other person might also go to uh, to meet you. Uh, that would be an example. And then coordination figures into, uh, you, I said, use the word a lot in this because it figures into morality. Uh, when you're thinking about which side should I choose uh, in this conflict, and specifically when you're trying to align with others, which side is everyone else going to take? And if if we if we can d discuss it beforehand, then we can just uh, choose a plan. That that is a pretty easy coordination problem. You don't uh, need ex uh, so much common knowledge reasoning there. You just say uh, 
I'm going to do this, and then they say they're going to do that. But if you have to do it simultaneously, that's when you would have to reason. Uh, if if you have to do it tacitly, and you know, if so, if it's a huge, if it's the whole country trying to decide how they feel about what a politician did, well, you can talk to some people, but you can't talk to everyone. And so there, we're going to have uh, common knowledge shaping people's judgments, and they're going to look out and say, well, there's a photo evidence of this, and that's going to hold a lot of sway because it's common knowledge even if it may be not the most relevant piece of information, just because you not only know it, you know everyone else knows it. Uh, so those are some of the things that uh, that come into it. Uh, in political science, it's a big part of theories of revolutions, because revolting is a coordination problem. If you revolt by yourself, you're just going to jail. If you revolt with everyone else, then you might uh, usher in a regime uh, change. So common knowledge is something that um, theories of revolution uh, are, are often very uh, concerned with. And I worked on the psychology aspect, uh, looking at games that people are playing where they have to try to coordinate and seeing how they use information that might be common knowledge compared to information, less information that's not common knowledge, uh, but you know they know that someone else knows something, but that other person doesn't know that they know it. And as I promised, you can get lots of headaches uh, thinking about these things. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so uh, this thing about coordination, it works both at a dyadic and also at a group slash collective level, right? Yes, absolutely. You can face a, a group uh, coordination problem, uh, which just means everyone needs to simultaneously make a decision and their payoffs are higher if they align or a majority align. It doesn't have to be everyone. Um, then, uh, then that's a, a group uh, coordination problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So uh, let's end the interview here then. Mm -hmm. uh, and Dr. Deschiola, just before we go, would you like to tell people uh, where are the best places on the internet for them to find your work? Yeah, of course. Um, so yes, my website. Um, we could add it. Uh, uh, on YouTube, but uh, it's uh, just pdesholing.com, uh, uh, and uh, my papers are there. And um, uh, uh, I would recommend the side taking hypothesis uh, for moral judgment, a 2016 uh, paper in current opinion uh, in psychology, as a, the, a quick summary of, of things and points to the other papers. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I will be leaving all of that in the description box of the interview. And Dr. Dacioli, it was again a real pleasure to have you on the show and thank you for taking the time. Great. Yeah, thank you so much. It was uh, great to talk. Hi there, thank you for coming to my channel and for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. So to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Uh, otherwise, I also have a PayPal and Subscribestar. And if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perelga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gelinas, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Condriano, Yane Henninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, and Dr. Jerry Muller, Herbert Gintis, and Ruth Gervois, and also my three producers, Isar Webb, Rosie, and Jim Frank. Thank you for all.